All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Jeremy Klein. He is a seasoned coach with a passion for Bitcoin who helps professionals and business owners transform their careers and personal lives for sustainable long-term success and well-being. As the host of the Change Work Life podcast, he talks with individuals who have redefined their career trajectories and explores practical changes anyone can make to achieve a more fulfilling work-life experience. I'm excited to dive into the personal challenges people encounter when they study and hold Bitcoin, a topic I think should be highlighted more. So uh, welcome, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for, for coming on. I uh, I love that, uh, and, and we're going to talk about this, you are also transforming your own life, I think, after, after finding uh, Bitcoin. But first off, I want to start... Uh, and uh, of course, people uh, should listen to our conversation, but you are offering a complimentary coaching session for anyone listening. And so the, the URL to find more info and um, uh, apply for that is in the, in the description. So if you like uh, uh, what Jeremy's approach is, then uh, yeah, check that out and make sure that... Uh, that you apply for that. So I want to start with that because we never know like who finishes till the end, right? We're going to mention it at the end. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I, I really appreciate that, that, that you offer that. And, um, yeah, let's dive, uh, let's dive into what you do because you are a professional coach coach for quite a few years. Um, and yeah, I just want to start with, you know, tell me a bit about your journey of becoming a coach and kind of like changing your, your own career career path. Um, I'm a certified coach as well, but I'm not that active. I uh, I have some entrepreneurs that that I coach and help, but um, not like on a on a daily basis. So uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to start with that. Yeah, sure. So what I do now is I help, as you mentioned, professionals and business owners who have become stuck. There's something they want to change but they're a bit stuck about what it is that needs to change um, or maybe how to go about it. So a typical example might be someone who is not really enjoying their job, but they don't really know what they need. Is it one or two tweaks to what they're doing at the moment? Is it a wholesale career change? What is it that's missing that they need to add or maybe take away that's going to make their work more fulfilling more enjoyable um, it might be that someone is perfectly happy in their job but they want to progress they want to get promoted and they're just not sure how to do that and maybe once they've done that how do they make that successful for them how do they avoid getting promoted into misery because let's face it that happens to plenty of people um Business owners, it's a similar thing. I, I had a client who had been successfully running her business for a number of years, and she came to me and said, Jeremy, I'm burning out. I'm working for people that I don't particularly want to work for. I'm spending all of my time on sales calls. My clients don't really appreciate what I'm doing for them. Help. And so we spent some time essentially redesigning her business. So we took a long look at the work that she wanted to do compared with what she was doing, how she wanted to deliver it, the clients that she wanted to work with. And uh, yeah, she's uh, in a, a much better place now as a result of that. And I think it's pretty common with a lot of coaches that their own journey into coaching often takes a similar path. So in my case, uh, my background is as a lawyer. I've done that for 20 years, something like that. And a few years ago, I started to have those thoughts along the lines of, is this really what I want to do for the next 20 years? Is this it? Am I happy to defer happiness, satisfaction experience until later on, you know, just save up and save up for retirement. And then when I hit this magic retirement age, then I'm going to go and do all these things that I'm not doing at the moment. And over the course of yeah, probably a few years, actually, including getting some coaching myself, I realized, no, it wasn't what I wanted to carry on doing. 
I had lots of ideas for things that I could do, but the thing I was struggling with was what was going to be a fit for me. So for example, along the journey, I started my own business in the podcast space, uh, providing a support service to podcasters. And it was a good business idea. And I still think it was a good business idea. And if I had decided that I wanted to pursue it and scale it, I could have made it a, a really viable business. But I did it and I realized I didn't like it. And that was a bit of a wake up call for me because it was um, it was a case that I I hadn't realized that just having a good idea was enough. I hadn't appreciated that it didn't just have to be a good idea, but it had to be a good idea for me. It was something yeah. that aligned with me, my skills, my values, all that kind of thing. Um, and so when I got some coaching and did all that work on myself, that led me to coaching. Um, you mentioned I've got a podcast all about careers and career change. I'm a naturally curious person. I enjoy asking questions. And so it was a bit of a, oh yeah, it's bleeding obvious. Of course, coaching is going to be a good fit for me because I like asking questions. I'm curious about people. Yeah. I'm interested. And so, yeah, I, I started coaching uh, just over two years ago and uh, finally left my job and went full time of it at the, the start of this year, 2024. Hey there, I wanna ask you for a quick favor. I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. We're going to talk about your coaching approach. But when you said asking questions, I felt like, yeah, that, that's probably the core of it, right? I mean, I think what you just described as, you know... A, probably everyone has like different points in their life where they reflect on like, what am I doing? Should I be doing this? Why am I actually doing this? Is this what I enjoy? Right. But, um, and, and so it starts with those questions or well, mostly it starts probably with some agitations, right? Like, why is this not working? <laughs> but eventually that, that those turn into questions, but it's kind of hard to, you know, and of course you can do it in, in, in some degree alone, but I, I think how I see coaching and I'm wondering what you think is like the, having someone that neutral that can help you reflect on the questions that you have, of which you probably know the answers already, right? But are sometimes too scared to admit that, that those are the answers. Um, yeah, like for me, that's kind of what, what coaching is, right? Like in my experience, you, you don't really have to understand, like if you coach an entrepreneur, like what their exact business is, for example, right? Like it's not, that, that's not what that is about, but yeah. How, how do you see that? Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, my starting point is that the person I'm coaching either already has the answers within them or they can access the answers. I mean, there is no shortage of information. You can learn almost anything almost for free, pretty much these yeah. days. It's accessing and applying those answers. That's the job of the coach. Um, can you do it by yourself? Yes, but it's so, so easy just to get stuck in your head and to have the thoughts just whizzing round and whizzing round and yeah. you, you kind of you don't you don't find the exit and I find with coaching you can just give that extra perspective you can just offer that reflection you can just ask that question and it unlocks something it's a beautiful thing when it happens when you you see someone on the other side who suddenly gets this aha moment okay Right. Yes. No, that makes sense. And again, it's like I was saying, it's, it sometimes seems bleeding obvious once you know it, but 
just getting there by yourself can be really, really hard work. And sometimes yeah. it just takes that person to listen to what someone's saying and listen to how they're saying it. Um, I had a, a session with someone yesterday and they were describing two possible courses of action they could take. And I could tell from their body language, one of them was, mm, you know, this isn't really a fit. Whereas when they were talking about the other one, I could kind of see them looking around and it was almost as though they were planning already how they would do it. So I could see there was that excitement there. And I said, I'm noticing that, you know, when you've talked about these, these two options, this is what's going on. And they kind of like, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you were talking, I thought about like how, how I learned to visualize it for myself is kind of like, you have this internal power, right? Or internal driving force, which let's visualize, uh, visualize it as like a straight line, right? Like that's what you have. That's what you can bring, bring to the world. And like along the way in your life, you have these little touch points, you know, especially a lot uh, of patterns, right? They come from your, your patterns and beliefs. They come from your youth and I kind of, for the, for the people who are watching, like I'm visualizing a straight line, but like people start at the origin, but they kind of diverge from, from that straight line. Right. And, and that is because, you know, the patterns and the beliefs that are part of their ego are deflect, or how do you say, like they are kind of like, yeah, deflecting them from that line of what their, their life force is basically. And I think the job of a coach uh, and with the example that you just give, right, is to show them where they are going and then help them reflect on, is this what brings you back to, you know, your own life force, right? Let's say the straight arrow, or does this keep you further away from it, right? And depending on how far you went off course, basically, you know, the the harder the challenge is to, to get back to, let's say yourself, right? But like identifying these little points where you took an exit that are not really helping you to, to get to like your, your life force. That's what you then help people with, right? To identify, okay, now if I want to go back, then I should go left. I should not go more right, for example, you know? And um, I think in the example you gave, that's, that's, uh, that's a very good one. Like people know, but the thinking... At least that's how I see it, right? Like the thinking distracts us. You have to feel um, feel which direction you should go because you know. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And a big part of that is also acknowledging the beliefs that are taking you away from that straight line yes. that you described. So, you know, you ask a kid what they want to do when they grow up and they'll probably tell you, you know, fireman or astronaut or whatever and there's no sort of there's no internal filter there's no construct which is making a child go oh I'd love to do that oh no but I can't do that I, I wouldn't be able to get paid for it I wouldn't be able to s start a family blah 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 blah. Yeah. and those those beliefs get cemented the older and older we get um, whether it's beliefs that come from your parents or from society or whatever it is so you know i'll talk to someone about quitting my job as a lawyer and they'll go but you're so well paid it's a respected job why on earth would you want to do that and you know that i could then believe that i could hear that voice going yeah you're right i mean you know it's a good job it's okay it's it sustains me i can find fulfillment and satisfaction elsewhere I mean, why why wouldn't i keep on with that and one of my jobs as a coach is to look at that and go, is that right? Is that yeah. really true? Yeah. What would be different if that wasn't right? What would you do differently? And you kind of encourage people just to play. You just encourage people to daydream and to think, oh, yeah, what could it be like? And then, you know, okay, so maybe I don't know, at the age of 40, you can't be a 
professional footballer. But you can definitely do more than I think a lot of people feel they can when you get to particularly your 30s or your 40s. Yeah. Isn't it also part of coaching that you identify that that you already made choices that made you end up in a certain place anyway, right? Like the when people come to you and they think about, should I switch my career or do something? Like, you know, those are choices, right? Um, but where you are is also a consequence of the choices that, that you made um, yeah. before, right? And so what you said, like the, the, the recognizing that you act in a certain way, maybe like those are your patterns, right? Or based on the beliefs that you have about yourself, but also that you acted in a certain way, right? You you made a decision at a certain point that you thought was a good decision. But like, for example, if someone says to you, like, why, why would you quit your lawyer job, you know, and it pays so well, like, of course, that is their own projection on the choice that you are thinking of, of making, right? And so... I think becoming aware of the fact that everything is a choice is already something that is really, really helpful. Absolutely, yeah. Where you are today is effectively the sum of your life choices to date. And the beautiful thing about that is that you can make choices going forward. Now, that's not to say that choices don't have consequences, I could, I'm not going to, but I could choose to leave my family and move to some commune in India if I wanted to. That is my choice. It would have consequences. Absolutely it would. But you're absolutely right. that The key point to remember first is that you have a choice. You don't have to go to work. You might you know, lose your job if you don't, um, but you do still have that choice. Yeah. So what is, what is then kind of like your, your coaching philosophy and like the core principles that, that you follow? I am a big believer in starting with where are you right now? What is it that makes this beautiful, complicated, messy person in front of me? So I love to spend time when it's right to do so with people unpacking that. What what are this person's strengths? What's the stuff that they are actually really, really good at? What's the stuff that they're not good at or they just really dislike doing? What are their values, the stuff that's really, really important. It's got to be there. So one of my top values is uh, collaboration. I'm I'm not someone who just wants to get on and do everything by myself. I want to work with people. It's one of the co- reasons coaching appeals to me so much. Uh, learning, curiosity, those are other important values of mine. I like to find out new stuff. I like to find out about people. So what's What are the things that are important for whoever I'm coaching? And I kind of see it like if you imagine going into an enormous shopping mall where you've never been there before. And the first thing I'd do is look for the map and look for the you are here dot. And that's kind of like what I do first is find that you are here because that can then informs where you next go so you've got this this picture of who you are all these things strengths values and so on that i just talked about with that information what are the options available to you and what are the options that align with that i was thinking when i first looked into starting my own business that i was going to do something IT related websites, maybe something that involved coding and okay, you know, I did a little bit of coding when I was a teenager, but now, you know, it's, it's all completely different, completely changed. And it doesn't fit with me. It was this, again, this tension between something that's a good idea and something that's a good idea 
for me or for you. And so, yeah, I, I look to help people figure out what's what are they and then what aligns with that. What's the stuff that if they follow this path, it's going to seem maybe not easy, but fulfilling. Yeah. I think two things to add to that. I like that you mentioned the map. I like the idea of the map is not a territory, right? Like we, we, we both have our own maps, but we operate in the same territory, right? Like, and I look at the territory different than how you look at. So kind of my map to navigate the territory is different than, than your map. But yeah, the starting point of where am I now on this map? And then kind of going to what does the map actually look like? You know, I think that that's, that's also what you mentioned. And then questioning, are these the things that I want on my map, right? Like, are these the things that are helping me in traversing through the territory? Or are those things that I want to remove from my map that, that I don't really need, right? And, and because when I do that, and I always kind of, I don't know if you're a gamer, but I visualize, you know, in games like Grand Theft Auto, or like sometimes you start with a map of the of the game world, right? And you only see the part where you are at. There's like a little circle. And the more you go through the world, you know, uh, there's like a gray overlay. And the more you traverse through the world, the, the gray opens up. So the parts that you discover um, are uncovered, basically. Right. And I always thought it was like a fun visualization of how, you know, basically your your world, the territory, you know, your life is an endless, could be an endless exploration of that territory. And the only thing you have is your is your map, basically. And other people can tell you stuff and give you information, but that's based on their map. Right. And so I think that the part of the journey is also to create your map while you're having the journey basically. And, um, yeah, I always thought that was a, that was a nice illustration. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's where curiosity fits in. You kind of like your, your grand theft auto idea, you, you, you get curious about, okay, well what's over here and what's over yeah. there. You don't, you're not committing to it. You can explore a bit of the map and think, oh, no, 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 that's not for no, me. Not I'm for gonna, me, exactly. I'm going to yeah. go somewhere else. But without that curiosity, without that exploration, you kind of close down. You you just end up in your tiny little square without see, without finding out whether there's this thing over here, which could actually be amazing. Well, let's just get curious. What's the worst that can happen? You find out that it's not for you. Big deal. Yeah. So what are the most common challenges like the professionals and the entrepreneurs you work with um, that, that they face today when they want to like change, change their life? A very common one is I'm not happy, but I don't know what to do about it. This is all I've known. So someone who has, I don't know, been working in IT for 10 years, been working as a lawyer for 15 years, it's all I've ever done. What could I do? What do I want to do? I'm just completely clueless. And there's, there's a few layers to that. There's the not knowing what is out there. There's the not knowing what could be a good fit. And then there's the, but how would I do that? If I wanted to move from law to becoming a, a computer programmer, well, hang on, what, you know, how, how would I even do that? I don't have any of the experience. And that's where the limiting beliefs come in, where uh, people, things I often see are uh, people will go, here is my education, here is my experience, suggest some jobs for me. And what you've created there is a I don't want to do list. But if you look at your I don't want to do list and 
come up with ideas based on that as to what you should do. Well, guess what? It's going to look quite a lot like your I don't want to do this list because it's it fits in with what you've already done before. So that's one of the things which is quite hard to to break out of. And that's why I like to take it in stages. Start with curiosity, start with possibility, start with exploration. Figure out whether coding could be a good option for you. What would it mean? What would life look like? What would a perfect day look like? Where would you be working? When would you be working? What would you be getting paid? All that kind of thing. And then figure out, okay, so if I was to pursue that, how could I do it? How long might it take? Will I have to take a cut in salary? Maybe, but for how long? What savings do you already have? Do you already have? It's you start to look at it from the lens of if I was to do it, how would I do it rather than can I do it? Yeah. So that's definitely a, a big challenge that I see a lot. Um, I think the other thing is just the stories that people tell themselves. It's like, oh, well, I couldn't do that because then blah, 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 blah. Really? You sure? What would happen if... Um, what would happen if, say, someone came to you and asked you this? What would your reaction be? Okay, so you'd actually be willing to help and it would be absolutely fine. So why aren't you prepared to ask this person then? What's what's holding you back? That kind of thing. Yeah. How do you see, like, not not getting on, on the on the chair of the person you coach, right? Like, uh, I think there's a thin line between helping someone reflecting on what they could do, right? Or what their answer would be to, for example, the question that you give now and actually giving the advice on what to do, right? I think that is the, I think it's too bad that coaching gets kind of a bad rep, not a bad rep, but like, anyone can become a coach, right? But being a good coach takes a lot of personal work. And, and we'll get into that, you know, when we, when we also talk about Bitcoin. But I think what I, the first thing I learned was, okay, if I want to help other people and they say something, um, you know, I, I want to be in touch with them as myself, but I also want them want to protect them from the the triggers and and the patterns that I have right so if I'm coaching you and you say something that triggers me it's my job to understand where that comes from and to control my reaction right if if you say something emotional and in some way I get triggered and then I react emotional then I'm not helping you and I'm also not helping myself right so yeah, how how do you see like like those those two things that uh, the last thing I just said, like that getting to know yourself before you can help someone else, but also the thin line between, yeah, kind of like pushing your map on the other person, right? Like that's something you definitely don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, and dealing with that one first, I think that's one of the reasons why lawyers without training make terrible coaches. Because lawyers are there to give answers. Good. Clients say, here is my problem. And lawyers go, this is what you need to do. Whereas coaching at its heart, coaches are trained not to give advice. Now, coaching comes in many styles and forms. And some coaches will be more directive. They will give advice. But at its heart, at, at its heart, it's really not about giving advice it's about helping the other person to find their own answers and i start from the point that who's the expert here it's not me it's the person in front of me they know themselves much better yeah i can reflect if my client says that it's okay for me to do so i can offer a suggestion but it's only a suggestion i'm never going to say this is what you should do. It could be, okay, I've seen this. Is that something that could be interesting to explore? Would you like to consider this as an option? But it is only ever that. It's only ever an option. And so that's really important. And 
I have found that on those occasions where I have started to go into more of imposing my own world and imposing my own views, that's where the wheels start to come off in the coaching conversation because mm -hmm. it, it, it's not productive. And it's really hard not to do that, especially if there's the voice in your head screaming, I know the answer to this. I know the answer to this. This is what you should do. Yeah. Um, it's quite a challenge trying to tamp that down, yeah. but it's much more productive to do that. Yeah. Um, well, there's an important point, right? Like when, when you are a coach and you're trying to help someone, it you know how how it works, but it doesn't mean you're the own master of it, right? Like you also have your own things, but I think that's the entire point that... Um, or at least for me, but I'm wondering how that is for you. Like helping people as a coach is also in a sense helping yourself, right? It's kind of like you, you, you see what other people struggle with, right? I mean, like my, my biggest conclusion is that every, everyone has something, right? Like you mess yourself up also when you have kids and you give them all the love and attention, all these things, like people mess themselves up with the tiniest nonsensical things basically right if they later check with their parents and they describe a situation something their father did or something that you know the father says like what are you talking about that's not how i said it or not how i intended something right but you you lived you know the first 30 uh, years of your life like he did say it in that way let's say rejecting you or something right and so i find it interesting that you know, and, and important to say, like, everyone has something. And I think also as a coach, you are working on your own things. I mean, that's kind of like the life life journey in general, right? And, um, but yeah, does, does, it, does it help you too, personally? Absolutely. And you make a really important point there about the importance of self-awareness, particularly when you're coaching, because you're only human, you know, you, you, you will have your own worldview. Everyone has their own worldview. And my client might say something which I disagree with. And there might exactly. be an instinct in me saying, no, no, that's not right. And I, I need the self-awareness to recognize when that thought is coming up and to decide whether or not it's something which I want to act on or whether it's something that I want to, that I want to rein in. And this is where curiosity is just this overriding thing. So if someone says something, then my instinct might be to react in a particular way, but I've got to assess, well, is that, is that going to help in this situation? If a client <laughs> looks like they're getting triggered if they're you know, starting to cry or look like they're getting cross then it's not going to help if i start to get defensive or apologetic or whatever it might be it's going to be more helpful if i observe i notice i go okay wow there's there was a strong reaction there what was going on there what what, what brought that on that's more likely to to help so yeah yeah it's it's not easy um keeping out your own world view but also i think it comes to acknowledging it um yourself um you can't just be this kind of detached zen master where nothing affects you that's just not realistic we're all messy coaches included it's just about having the awareness and making the decision making the choice about how you then what, what you do with that yeah yeah i think it's exactly that right like it's not that you should put it put your initial initial triggered reaction away somewhere like it doesn't exist because it's part of you right it's more about acknowledging that you have it and consciously deciding that you you act in a different way in that conversation right and i i think the more you experience that and do that the more you will also learn that that serves you better, right? So let's say you would also react in an emotional way. You are obviously not helping your client, but you're also 
kind of blocking yourself from allowing that curiosity to come true, you know, and instead of um, replying in a in an emotional or triggered way that you ask a question so you can learn from this other person and therefore also help yourself, right? That That is a way, way more beneficial long-term approach than, you know, in general, how lots of people react. Just it's, it's like triggered versus triggered versus triggered and it just kind of goes back and forth. But nobody's learning anything, right? And the distance is only getting bigger. And um, yeah, for me, that's been like a really like practical kind of reminder like if i challenge myself that that will always have a longer term benefit than that i just go with the ego you know and lash out for example um yeah so uh, do you have any practical tips on you know like practical tips you provide during your sessions to to help people like what's your what's your top two or three What was my top tip or trick? Crikey, that's um, that's an interesting one. I like to provide space. Another challenging thing for a coach is staying quiet. So someone will maybe answer a question, come to the end of a thought. And there's a feeling which might not be right, but there's this feeling that maybe there's more to come. And I find that if I, if I let that happen, it can get, you know, it, it, it gets almost to the point of discomfort, you know, where we're naturally inclined to fill a void. But if I just allow that extra bit of space sometimes nothing comes and i'll i'll go in with a, a reflection or a question but quite often i'll just stay quiet for a little bit longer a little bit longer than feels comfortable and something else comes out and may, maybe that's it it's it's slowing down and seeing what else comes out i'm going to have to turn that question around on you when when, when you've done coaching what, what what are the sort of the the tricks that you find have been particularly effective. I'm going to think of something else, but I would want to say the same thing because this is like my thing, right? I like talking and I like keeping a conversation going, but I a hundred percent agree with what you said about um, giving that space because it's also pretty confrontational in, in some way, right? When, when someone you view as a neutral person or that you like hire to help you asks a very, how do you say, like a pointed question, right? A, a question that strikes you, for example, th that already could be triggering, right? That you think like, damn, why does this person see that in me and I don't? What, what, what does that mean? Right. And so you, you need to give people some space to, to work through that. And I think it's also inviting that you do that. I, one of the first things I also learned was you, you can welcome someone, but they should come, right. You can, you can welcome them into the space. Um, but it's their choice to come. And, and some people need more space for that than others. Um, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm someone who likes to get to the point quickly, but I, I, I've come to realize that that is how I work and what I like, right? And, and, and I think to, to what we said before, the fact that you can peek into someone else's brain or their inner workings is also a learning for for yourself right because yeah you are you but but everyone is flawed right uh, you, you, we are also flawed and so i think it's uh i think it's a gift if someone comes into your space and shares like 
how they work and 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 who they are right so again that principle of doing something that maybe goes against how you feel you should act but believing that if you do that that you will learn from the other person but but also from your from yourself yeah i think i think a lot like that in in kind of like these processes or me- like kind of, kind of like frameworks or mechanics like how how these interactions work and that for me is like an anchor point to commit myself to try it because doing it is not easy because i have my own challenges just like you have your own challenges right but so i think like those rational kind of like let's call them points on the wall right or like invisible notes that i would have in such a conversation i think keep me um yeah kind of centered in in a conversation like that and i like to emphasize that when i see that with the other person as well like i try to um give them like that anchor point like hey see see what you did there like see the the path that you walked and and do you see the the different outcomes of of the two choices that you could make but you you made this outcome um that you deem more more positive right so so like create an anchor point of of a positive um example of thinking in yeah through your thoughts in a in a certain way yeah yeah and one of the things i absolutely love about coaching especially when you're coaching someone for the first time is you never know what's going to come up in front of you there are some people who it takes a while for them to trust you and to open up and they might be of a, a more introverted character like I am. So I, I take longer to reflect on answers rather than sort of having a stream of consciousness and that being the way that I that I answer questions. And you, you kind of need to be aware that that's a possibility. And then you get people who come in and they are very willing to open up about some very, very personal matters straight away. And it's a privilege that they already put that trust in you at, at such a, an early point and then you don't know what they're going to want to work on um what are the challenges at the moment how they're going to react to certain questions and it can be i suppose when you were talking about it in those terms it can be quite um you know challenging you can kind of think oh cool, what's going to happen um whereas with practice, I'm kind of learning to reframe that question as, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. and it's, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, yeah. I've done quite a lot of one-off sessions with people recently, and I just love this, this you know, when, when you let someone into the Zoom room, you've no idea who's going to turn up, what state are they going to be in, even what do they look like, what are their, what's their backdrop like. Um, and it's it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's it's funny that you said <laughs> never an extreme of consciousness. Then I thought, yeah, that's how I, <laughs> that's how I think. <laughs> um, it's one of the differences that's been described to me between introverts and extroverts. How introverts, when they're asked a question, will probably go silent for a bit. And then they will process the the answer in their mind with a view to coming out with something which is more fully formed. Whereas an extrovert will start to answer, and then kind of that that thought process comes out rather than staying internally. So yeah. that was really helpful for me because on that I definitely identify as an introvert. Um, I mean, when I was being coached, I'd get asked a question, and I would pause for a very very long time mm. whilst I thought about the answer to that question. Yeah. yeah, I would say I'm I am more of an introvert, but it's just my mind works faster than m- me being introvert. <laughs> I think it's that. So, um, yeah, I definitely learned to also um, like structure my thoughts. Right, like if you have a mind that's always going, um, you cannot expect that that other people follow you, right? So you're kind of forced to learn how to yeah structure 
what you think or what you want to convey or what you want to ask, right? And it's even now that I'm trying to be aware of it, like I think while I talk, right? So uh, yeah, I, I wonder what uh, how people perceive that, right? Who also listen to the, to the to the to the podcast, but like I I don't know any other way, but um, I try to be more aware of like constructing the thoughts in a bit of more coherent way than like how they how they go through my head and all of the connections um, connections that I make. But again, I think that does come from talking with other people. Uh, in a in a more than superficial way right like conversations like this or doing the coaching like the fact that you see all these other examples of how other people are um at least for me worked work work to my benefit like just just to accept like okay i'm me at this moment but yeah like you said in the beginning like you you can change into anything you want right but it's more about uh the recognition that where you are is, is a is a result of your choices, and that it's totally up to you to decide. Like, what do I want to keep, and, and what do I want to discard, or what do I want to improve? Basically, yeah, completely. Yeah. So, what are um, like patterns or trends you've seen with people who successfully transitioned? You know, to new career paths or in your life um, with uh, or in their lives with uh, with the people you work with like what are the things that that click for them or yeah again it all comes back to curiosity when when people are when people approach change through curiosity then that's when things start to click when things start to come in place you 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 open your mind to the, the possibilities rather than closing down oh no no that, that that could never happen um yeah silly example but i've um during lockdown i uh found the hobby of making jam we've got um a rhubarb plant in the back garden which was you know nothing was happening with it and so I thought oh, I wonder if I could turn it into making jam and I did and I found I enjoyed it and other people really like it Fine. so it has gone through my head I wonder what it would look like if I started to do that on a, a bigger scale rather than just making it for me and you know, giving the odd jar to friends and family at Christmas time or that kind of thing and so it's not something I've done yet but it keeps on coming in mind yeah, I know someone who does actually sell jams and chutneys and preserves around Christmas time. I should have a conversation with them, find out what it's like, just to explore the possibility. And when someone has, if you like, successfully made the transition, so perhaps if they've started a new job, started a new a new career, what seems to work then is keeping that curiosity going um one of my first clients had she came to me when she'd actually already shifted jobs so she'd been an architect for 10 years i think and you know that is a tough profession to get into lots of exams lots of studying again very highly regarded and it was making her miserable and so she pretty much dropped herself right down to the bottom of a new ladder and uh, started an apprenticeship in marketing. And she came to me with the recognition that she was already 10, 12 years into her working life, albeit at the start of this new career. And she wanted to figure out some ways that she could kind of accelerate her progress with the knowledge and experience that um, she'd got. And so, again, it was through the the, the, the curiosity, the possibility, um, realising that now she, that she had this clean slate, she had more options, even if she was an apprentice and was, you know, getting a lot of the... the <laughs> 
the slightly more menial jobs, she had the opportunity to reflect on where she wanted things to go and what she could start doing now to put that in place. So who who she could talk to. She was um, quite keen to start building her own like marketing portfolio, her own social media presence. And she had a lot of fears around, oh yeah, but what if no one looks at it or no one likes it, which is interesting because there's two opposites. You know, if no one looks at it, then there's not going to be anyone who doesn't like it. And if people do look yeah. at it, well, okay, they've looked at it, they might not like it, they might not agree with it, but at least, you know, it's out there. And so, um, yeah, we um, we tried things. Well, she tried things. I just encouraged her to, to do yeah. so. Um, so, yeah, trying things. Um, one of my favorite questions is asking people when they're contemplating doing or not doing something, what's the best that can happen and what's the worst that can happen? And I asked them to scale those on one to tens. So like one is the apocalypse. It's the end of the world. There is nothing worse than this. And 10 is absolute nirvana. This just is, is amazing. Couldn't be better. And when people think about what the worst that can happen is, it often comes out, it's rarely lower than a five. And quite often it's even like um, a six or a seven. And you kind of think, okay, well, that actually sounds pretty good. And then they go to the other end and it's you know, nine or occasionally 10. Yeah. And you realize it's, um, I mean, it's kind of like, it, it's one of the ways I think about Bitcoin, um, you know, this sort of asymmetric risk. So, you know, What's the worst that can happen if Bitcoin goes to zero? Okay, it's not great. <laughs> By any stretch of the imagination, it's not great. But it wouldn't be the apocalypse. It wouldn't be the end of the world. We'd be okay. Whereas the other end of the scale, what if it does take off? What if we do enter a world of hyper-Bitcoinization and it does become you know, the world's reserve currency? That's that's a pretty amazing scenario. So when you compare the two, you you kind of realise that the the risk of not doing something is easily set off by what the gains could be if it does turn out right. Yeah, yeah, fully agree. What I I, I use a similar question, but then I also add, um, and then what? Right. <laughs> so like you, you your example of your client like oh i'm gonna post and nobody's gonna see it yeah and then what you know okay then i try 10 more times and there's still no one sees it yeah and then what you know eventually you get to you know maybe what i do is not good enough right and okay and then what yeah okay then i have to decide to do something else okay you know, and 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 for the other side, it's it's the same. The positive outcome is like, okay, and then what? Well, then I have more time for my family, right? Or I feel more aligned, or whatever. Yeah, and then what? You know, like, and so the and then what? Especially for the negative thoughts, um, you know, or scenarios that that people, you know, I always say you you fantasize about that, right? Like uh, you you can rationally think about certain dangers or challenges or something, but no one can predict the future. So. You know, um, and 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 like you said, it it comes down to just yeah, you do it or you don't, right? There's no there's no middle way. If you agree to to do it, but you do it half baked, then you're not really convinced, right? And if you if you decide not to do it, but you're still complaining about it, then you know there's something different that you that that, that you should look at, right? As to what 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 the challenge is that that you need to take need to tackle so the and then what question is always a, a good one to to help people realize like yeah i'm just making that up literally making that up right this is not a rational thought so okay uh yeah why why should you believe it right how does it help you in the moment where you could for example objectively say um you know this is not something i want to do like a job for example yeah yeah well you mentioned Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that you know people. Um, uh, it's the it's it's the fear of failure. People want to know that what they're doing is the right thing. You know, this is 
this is the social media post that is going to land with people and uh, is going to get people to engage or this is the way that I'm going to get more clients. But you never know. That's the thing. No one mm -hmm. can say this is the right way to do it. It's all experimentation. It's all trying out. Yeah. Do you know what you're doing in your life? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm having fun figuring it out. Yeah. No, but this is it, right? Like everybody's winging it. <laughs> I would say that's another post-it on my, on my wall. But like, <laughs> yeah, for real, like that. Even the, even the people you look up to or see or follow, they have no, they have no clue. They're also trying to figure it out, right? I think that is that like once you embrace that, that it's okay that you're figuring it out and that other people are also figuring it out. Then like what what can go wrong, basically? You know, like there yeah. There there's just you can do anything you want. But it's about uh about I think about figuring that out, but also giving yourself the space to, as you said, like try something. If it fails, then it fails. Like it's you, you, le you always learn. So, you know, I think that attitude already um, is something that that helps pe people uh, a lot. And uh, yeah, wh what I wanted to say is that I love that only after fifteen minutes, fifty minutes, we mentioned Bitcoin on a Bitcoin <laughs> podcast. So that's great. And but that's this is the great, uh, the, the the best moment to to take the the leap into Bitcoin. And I think. I wanted to ask you about your journey into Bitcoin, so I would love for you to share that. But also, I think the questions I wrote down do tie back to what we just talked about, right? And this is exactly kind of like the setup that that I was looking for. So I think it's a great transition. But I'd love to hear uh, first a bit about like your journey, how you, well, you went from lawyer to coach. And I think also three, two, three-ish years ago, uh, you got into Bitcoin. So yeah, how did that go? Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things, you know, I had heard of Bitcoin and I knew nothing about it. And then late 2020, when we're all still in lockdowns and I'm going hard on self-development and learning and I'm listening to a lot of podcasts and I hear someone talk about Bitcoin and crypto generally. And he says, yeah, by the end of 2021, by the end of uh, 2021, Bitcoin is going to reach 200,000. And in four years time, it's going to be $1.2 million. And I thought, wow, okay. I think I'd quite like a piece of that. So like many people, I got into it by hearing the number go up narrative. But I didn't know anything about it. So... I started to explore. So this guy on the podcast had his own guide. I listened to other podcasts where they've got like the um, Bitcoin for beginners, what it's all about guides. And I did the most important thing when starting out. I bought a little bit of Bitcoin. You know, yeah. Signed up to an exchange, got myself a hot wallet, tried the, you know, transferring to and from seeing how it works and then bought into the narrative you know this is going to 200,000 250,000 um went in at pretty much what turned out to be the top and then thought I think in some ways it helped me that I went in close to the top because I, I understood that this was likely to be a long-term play. And as soon as I went into the red, I figured, well, I'm not going to sell it now because I think there is a reasonable chance. I need to do some more learning, but I think there's a reasonable chance that it probably will go back up again. And it might take a few years to do so, but I think it probably will. And I then spent, that time just learning and learning more and more principally through podcasts and the the moment when i realized that it wasn't just a number go up thing 
and that there were so many more possibilities, so many things that Bitcoin could fix was when I heard an interview with uh, Eric Hersman of the Gridless, and he was talking about the things that they're doing in Africa with Bitcoin mining and enabling electricity supply to villages which didn't have any electricity. And that was swiftly followed by an interview with, I can't remember his name, but he's like the founder of Vespin, um, where they you know, mine Bitcoin on landfill sites using the, the waste methane. And having always had an interest in environmental issues, that was a real, oh, you mean Bitcoin can do that? You know, never mind this nonsense narrative about boiling oceans and using all the fossil fuels. It can act as a catalyst for renewables. It can be part of the solution. And then I learned about more and more things that Bitcoin could be a solution for. So, you know, whatever you're looking at, whether it's the solving the problem of money, whether it's the, um, the human rights angle and the privacy angle or as I said, the, the energy and environmental angle, whatever it is, it just over the past three or so years since I first found out about this thing, I've just realized just how much it can do, just what Bitcoin can be a part of to make people's lives better. Um, and, and it makes me incredibly optimistic, actually, that there is this technology. I, I've always generally thought that humans can achieve a lot through technological innovation. And this is just an amazing example of a technological innovation, which has so many possibilities. It could just do so much. It can be part of so much stuff. And so I've, I've got to the stage where I am well and truly on board the, this thing's got to stay. This thing can really help so many problems in the world. And then I got to thinking, well, what, what can I do to be part of this? I'm not a finance person. I'm not a technical person. As we talked about, I'm not a coder or anything like that. And so more recently, I've been thinking about what's my own proof of work that I can apply to this space. Um, and so that's why I'm now looking to, yeah, looking to, to looking to coach other Bitcoiners or people who work in the Bitcoin space because we're all people, we're all messy, we're all got our own fears and limiting beliefs and challenges and desires for change and roadblocks. I can contribute my skills to helping people do that. And it's been um it's been quite a revelation thinking along those lines. Yeah, absolutely love that. I I think what sticks out to me, not only that that you are now you know, at this moment where you are really like, okay, I'm going to contribute to this in in my own way. But I think, you know, the fact that you bought at the top and it went down and in the red uh, and, and that you consciously chose, okay, I need to study this, right? I, I, a few episodes back, I had a talk with Alex who um, who talked about humbling yourself, right? <laughs> And, and that's kind of what I hear in, in, in the story you share. It's like, if you, and, and it ties back to what we talked about, I think, right? Especially like the, I don't know what I'm doing, but none of the people know what they're doing, right? Like that's humbling yourself, right? That's just, it's not a negative thing to think that. It's actually a very positive thing, I think, to say like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing my best, you know? And, and, and I think this is the same, like, okay, I, I made a conscious decision. I bought Bitcoin at a certain point. I had no clue about, uh, you know, technical analysis, blah, blah, you know, me neither, by the way, but like, okay, well, so the choice ended up in, in me buying at the top. It's going down now. I don't know exactly why, but I'm going to do my best to figure it out. Right. And I think th that, that that's, it's a, it's a, it's a big, tiny decision. Right, that that humbling yourself, it because it gives you, I think, the freedom to, as you mentioned before, like be curious and just start doing the work to figure out, 
is this something for me, as you, by the way, alluded to before, right? But then, of course, the Bitcoin rabbit hole is never ending, so you stay <laughs> here. But yeah, I like to highlight that part because that is something that that I think is not highlighted enough, but also misunderstood that, you know, um, anyone can factually figure out how this system works, right? I mean, there's so many resources that, that you can read um, on different comprehension levels, you know, that, 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 you know, factually explain how Bitcoin works. But I think, and, and this is a general comment, you know, in the Bitcoin space that understanding Bitcoin is not an IQ test, but rather, you know, an ego test or an emotional intelligence test. How, how do you see this also, you know, with your, with your, with your own journey? Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think that it's, it's almost like you choose your entry point. So, okay, my, my original entry point was, hey, I can get rich with this, wear Lambo. Um, but then my, my, my slightly more grown up entry point, my, my entry point of understanding was the environmental side, because that's just something that has, you know, it's, it's interested me for probably 30 years, you know, I, I was at school and there was like, an environmental committee and I wanted to be part of it. So it's, it's, it's always interested me. That was my entry point. And I think I've, I've been thinking recently about, you know, conversations with other Bitcoiners are great, but really where the, the progress is going to happen is having conversations with people who are not yet Bitcoiners. And I kind of think that a lot of it is finding that entry point. What's the, what's the thing that, concerns them what's the thing where you can kind of say okay well you know there is this thing that can provide a solution so is it education of women in afghanistan for example where bitcoin can provide the means to make that happen is it um is it just this this awareness of grocery bills going up and up and up and not really understanding what was going on or, you know, not being able to get on the housing ladder. Um, I was speaking to someone recently where they were keen to point out that it wasn't their husband who was a Bitcoiner who had orange pilled them, but they had orange pilled themselves. And that was through reading the book, The Progressive Bitcoiner. And it was the message in that, the way it was framed, that, um, that chimed with them and that was kind of like their their entry point down the rabbit hole and so that that's how i think about it it's finding that entry point and then opening up this vast world and you're quite right i mean no one can understand all of it there's just too many aspects i mean you could spend a lifetime i think you could spend a lifetime understanding something like the lightning network for example i'd don't understand it at all but if that's your thing then great and then it opens up your awareness knowledge of uh, of other parts of it so yeah what's what's your entry point what was your entry point i love i love that yeah a number go up was my well partially number go up but also i first video i saw was called I think it was called Bitcoin Explained. It's on Vimeo, but unfortunately it's locked. So I wanted to share it before, but it's I cannot find it anymore. Um, yeah, so I got into it, I think, from more like a technological perspective, like the internet needs a currency like that. And then, of course, when I bought it and it went up, then I wanted more. And so like number go up. You know, I think that's a great entry point in general, you know, the... You know, you come for the greed and you stay for the revolution, you know, like that. But I think what you said about entry points and, and you know, that someone orange built themselves, I think that goes back to what we said about map and territory, right? I, I, you know, if you talk about Bitcoin as a territory, it's, I think it's endless because it covers like, all of human interaction eventually, right? All of the value exchanges that we do and, and everything that comes from that. So it really touches upon a certain, um, yeah, like foundational element of, of human interaction. But the map, 
right? The map is partially created from, you know, your background, your interests, your knowledge, right? If you're technical or not, or if you come from, well, a lawyer background or an entrepreneur background, you know, like that creates your map. And and when it comes to orange pilling, I I don't believe you can orange pill other people, right? They they orange pill themselves, and you can point them to like spots on the map, right? Maybe we go back to the GTA map, like, well, you should explore this or you should explore that, right? And try to kind of like level with another person to. Well, basically understand where they are at on their map again you know uh this is a good team good analogy right like where they are on the map and say like hey you should look at this or you should look at that just explore this and you know come back to me if you have any questions or we can reflect on that together and then eventually you know just like in coaching how it clicks for people you know i think you know, um, if you if you have someone you coach and you see it click for them, it's kind of like their thoughts align, right? Their thoughts, intentions, feelings, desires, like everything aligns, right? And it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, like this is it. And it feels good also because it's aligned. There are no, yeah, it's, it, it makes sense. You know, like, okay, I have a good feeling. I, I should follow this, right? And I think it's the same with... Um, with orange pilling in that sense. Like someone starts from their own map, they are in the Bitcoin territory, they go explore and by helping someone orange pill themselves, you you do that by pointing them in different directions and I think helping them reflect on the things that they found or the the you know the the things they ran into with regards to challenging their own beliefs and and stuff like that. So yeah. Well, with regards to challenging your beliefs, I think, you know, this is a team that comes back a lot, like to study and understand Bitcoin. You have to do that, right? Challenging your own beliefs. Why, why do you think it's so hard for people to do that? Change is uncomfortable, fundamentally. And if you have been brought up believing that the world is shaped in a particular way when something comes up that challenges that belief it can be very very uncomfortable and it goes in part to identity you know what 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 is your identity and how does that fit in how does that fit into the wider world I, I I've always seen myself as uh yeah a pretty conservative small c kind of person so you know the the, the world is a, is it as it is good job good pension that kind of thing safe for retirement you know I've, I've never seen myself as particularly a radical on left or right and yet I've been drawn into this thing, which there, there's there's kind of felt like this incongruency because Bitcoin is radical. I mean, we are talking about something which could entirely upend the financial system as we know it, or at least draw attention to the fact that the system is upending itself. In it, suddenly I'm kind of like this. Um, you know, at, at the extreme level, I'm, I'm like this crazy outsider who's starting to doubt what governments are telling us about, particularly on on the the money side of things, and who's starting to think, yeah, all this regulation, all this stuff that's going on, all this you know, this increased KYC, all this possible extra surveillance through CBDCs and, and that kind of thing. Th there's a part of me which kind of makes me think, am I sounding like the crazy conspiracy theorist here? Am I, am I sounding like the the tin hat person? And so it's one thing that I'm, I think I'm still working through is like this, the way that it kind of, doesn't fit with this identity that I thought I had. So I've kind of had to 
rethink my identity a bit and that's that's always going to be unsettling because there's you know there's there's uncertainty there's well if i don't believe that what do i believe and how are those people that i know and love who've known me for years and years and years going to see me you know what what's going to be their reaction to yeah those pounds or euros or dollars that they are losing value it's not that everything else is going up it's that those are going down and by yeah. the way here's this you know this magic internet thing which could actually be a, a solution <laughs> it's um... you became a punk rocker jeremy that's what andreas antonopoulos <laughs> says right bitcoin is punk rock so you know if you were uh, a lawyer before then a punk rocker is maybe uh it's a, it's a big <laughs> it's a big step you know <laughs> but what I like that you share those doubts, but like, what keeps you going then? Why, why didn't you quit? And we're just like, I'm going to give in to the opinions of all these other people that I fantasize about. That's a really good question. Um, I think it's the more I've learned, the more my conviction has just been solidified. And I've got, I, I know that I've got to be careful of that. I've, I've got to make sure that I don't, become blinded the other way i've i've got to um you know, keep, pay attention to the challenges it's like um uh lynn olden says you know you you steal man both sides of the argument and then figure out where where you want to come down but that's that's what it's been it's 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 been this learning it sparked a, curios a curiosity and the more I've learned it, the more I've thought, yeah. I, I, and that's another thing as well. It feels strange to be early. It feels strange to be part of this. You know, we're, we're still pretty much part of the vanguard. You know, we're, we're there yeah. kind of at the beginning. And it feels really strange. And, of course, there's the uncertainty that, you know, may, maybe we are all wrong. Who knows? Um, I mean... Okay, if I'm going to be wrong, I'm going to be wrong alongside some very, very bright people. Um, but it's just, it's made sense to me. The more I've learned about it, the more it has made sense. And it's changed my worldview on so much. It's taught me so much. I mean, I knew precious little about economics before I started down this rabbit hole. I knew precious little about energy before I started down this rabbit hole i probably would have been probably ambivalent towards something like nuclear power but it's through you know listening to podcasts hearing the discussions about energy uh hearing from people who actually know this stuff what are the real risks and what is just fud in relation to nuclear and that's kind of made me go no, that's it's got to be part of the energy solution going forwards, and that's just something that I would never would have come to had I not started down this. So, yeah, it's just if every time I have doubts, I listen to something else, I learn another angle, and I think on the balance of probabilities, I'm probably on the right side here. Yeah, but it feel it, but but there's this discomfort because. I'm I'm still very much in the minority and that's a very odd place for me to be. Yeah. It's probably, I, I, you know, I, I, was, yeah. I was like the good, I was, that was the good kid at school. I was the one who was, you know. You're the rebel now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I kept the rules, you know. I, 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 I was, if you, you know, are the good, the good kid, right? Like, are you thinking for yourself? You know, it's kind of the first thing I'm saying. Like, it's kind of like following a rule that someone else, uh, post on you right like that that I, I i think that's kind of like one of those elements like you can follow rules like rules are not rules in general are not bad but bad rules are bad you know and and i think that's kind of if you know or accept that nobody knows what they're doing and someone imposes a rule on you and you think this rule is stupid then like who who is Who's right? And, and you might be right. And I think that is kind of also what this is about, right? Like, 
if you dive into certain rules set by rulers, no smarter than us, because they're also figuring it out. Yeah, you know, if yeah. if, if you did the work and and you believe that these are not the right rules, then why would you conform to them, right? And I, I now that I'm saying this, like I know that that is for some people perhaps like an uncomfortable expression. Yeah, and I'm but I'm what's the other side the... of the choice? Choice, right? You just conform yeah. and you don't think like, okay. I'm I'm reminded of a story someone told me ages ago when this was when they were leaving school and you had you know the the awards ceremony and all the people who were receiving awards for basically keeping the rules doing well they were sitting at the front and all the people who weren't getting the awards they were sitting at the back and the person on stage who was handing out the awards said something along the lines of to all of you sitting at the front well done congratulations but you will be working for the people who are sitting at the back before too long. Oh, wow. That's great. I love that. That's really good. Yeah. And, and in general, I love your reflection. I think it's spot on, like really appeals to me. I, I, I think I have a similar, similar view on it. And, and I like what you said about, you know, the doubting, or no, like you said, like your belief, you, you talked about belief or conviction, you know, I think conviction is a kind of a tainted word, right? Because it sounds like you are convinced that something will happen because someone else said so, right? But I, I think in Bitcoin, the belief or the conviction can only come, really come from the, from, from the work that you put in, you know, because that is what Bitcoin is. It's inviting you to study it right and and, and said it uh, said it many times on with my guests on the on the podcast like you don't have to buy bitcoin and all these things like you if something triggers you just start studying it right like you said before just go down one path one entry point and and see what you can learn about it right and and i think that is also what we're in general what we're doing as bitcoin is we are inviting people to study it and all the adoption by Bitcoin is 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 f voluntary, right? And the the conviction comes from from the work that you put in. And so, I like that you are mindful of that. But I think the other side of that is that you know you can also just decide to trust yourself. <laughs> you know, like everything you did up until now. Uh, you know, with, with your integrity and your own motivation, et cetera. Right. And so I think therefore, therefore I think it's just such an interesting personal journey because it's really easy to start talking like, you know, I need to watch my own belief and blah, blah. Like that is kind of doubting yourself. Right. But the other side is like, yeah, I figured out I can trust myself. I like that thought. I have both thoughts, so similar to you, but I like the last one more, you know, feels more like on, on purpose in a sense, but also that ties into what you said, like we are so early, am I the crazy one, et cetera, right? Like, I think that that falls into kind of the same bucket. Like what, what does it mean if we think that? Like we don't deserve this, right? Like we did the work mm. and we are somewhere like, yeah, like you said, like, on the vanguard um well yeah you you ended up there like no one put you there right and so i think that's also an interesting thought like do i deserve to do i believe i deserve to have this opportunity because i decided to change my world view and challenge my thoughts and patterns and blah blah, blah and i ended up here yeah that's brilliant. I love that. And, and it, it comes up in coaching as well, this, you know, belief that you don't deserve something. And, you know, you know, let's say that, I don't know, Bitcoin does get to 10 million. And those of us who even got in at, at this stage, it means that, you know, we've done really, really well. Um, you know, there's kind of like, well, but, but, but what have you done to deserve that? And it's, well, you know, you you did the work, you showed the faith, and it's not necessarily going to happen. Absolutely, it's not necessarily going to happen. But, um, yeah, I think that that 
is something that holds people back is a feeling that they don't necessarily deserve success. People definitely don't give themselves credit for the part that they have uh, played in in that success. And I think that comes, then that leads to this feeling of not deserving this this imposter syndrome. You know, I'm not good enough to have been in this position. Um, but you are here, the, right? That's yeah. what I think. You are here. So what's, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> but it's a fascinating insight. I've never thought about it that way. I think that's brilliant. Mm. So lots of critics, you know, I, I don't know if, if you watch like lots of videos online, you know, but there's, or in general, I think if you come across people that are very like opposed to um, Bitcoin, you know, like I, I think lots of critics lack like coherent, substantial arguments against Bitcoin, right? Right? Like a lot is emotional talk, trigger talk, you know, is do you see that as part of, you know, what we just talked about, like the changing your beliefs is scary, right? So I'm just going to ignore that. I'm not going to do that. And, you know, I'm just going to die, you know, <laughs> go with the triggered flow or something. Do you think it ties back to that? You know, like I, I think lots of people in Bitcoin would love to have substantiated debates with the people that say they oppose it, but not a lot of people do it, right? Like last last week, there was a debate between Eric Voorhees and Anthony uh, Scaramucci versus Peter Schiff and uh, Nuriel Rubini. So two Bitcoiners two, uh, versus two gold guys, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't watch it. I, I just couldn't watch it. Like it's not even a it's 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 not a conversation, right? I hear these, these like Rubini, super famous guy. She talks about it's going down, it's nothing, it's zero, it's blah blah. But like, okay, why? Like, why, why, why? I I was just thinking, why, why, why? Like, what? I can say these things, you know. So what? Like, what's your view on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I've got two things that come to mind. One is that I am very aware, particularly for me, how easy it is for me to believe someone when they say with when they're talking with conviction about something which I perceive that I don't really know much mm. about, and that's something that I've had to check and think about. So I, you know, I've I've heard a podcast interview. A good example was um, like when uh, Russia first uh, took its action in Ukraine, and I heard an interview with someone who was talking about how much other parties, particularly the US, were potentially to blame or had influenced all that kind of thing. And I was kind of like, oh, yeah, no, I can see a lot of that. And, that, you know, they, they sounded very, very educated, knew what they were talking about. And then a couple of weeks later, I heard another interview, which pretty much refuted 75% of what that person had said. And again, it was someone who was educated and seemed to know what they were talking about. And so I was very aware then I've, I've got to do my own work looking at both sides. Um, when it comes to these debates, it's, I've used this word so many times, but it's such an important word, curiosity. If you just got, you know, two people going, this is the position and the other one going, I don't agree. This is the position. And they're just, you know, clashing, clashing, clashing. It's like you said, there's, there's always nuance um, in almost any subject. There is nuance. There's, there's both sides. No one is ever completely right. And no one is ever completely wrong. And I think people would do well to remember that, particularly when you get the debates that you described or you get people trolling each other on Twitter. There's there's people just get so wedded and stuck to their own ideas that there's and maybe it goes back to what we were saying about identity. You know, there's there's no room for allowing the possibility that the other guy might have some good points. You might not agree with everything they say. But okay, what are the points that you think? Yeah, all right. So where's that coming from? What's the yeah. challenge to that? Where's that right? Where's that wrong? So I, I just the world would be a better place if people stopped just entrenching their positions and 
shouting at each other and just got more curious about the other person's point of view. Yeah. I think it ties back to lots of things we touched upon in this conversation, right? It's the kind of humbling yourself, but also being curious, like humbling, like I don't know, knowing that you don't know everything, right? And then being curious. That's, you know, could be the same thing, like knowing that you don't know anything, right? So there's something to learn. Um, I think the humble part is more like also respecting the other person up until a certain point, right? Like if you, yeah, you, you should welcome someone first before, you know, they, they would open up. Right. But if you, if you see that someone is, is only like um, conversing in like a triggered way, and you reply in a triggered way, you know, I think we mentioned this in the beginning that it's like a ping pong back and forth, but you know, you are not helping yourself and you are also not helping them. Right. Because your, your motivation is to, well, maybe help them change their mind because you think you, you have the, you know, more valuable uh, opinion or, or side, but yeah, just this, uh, yeah, I agree. This, just this back and forth does, Nothing. And it's also, I think, very confusing for the people who watch you, right? But maybe that's the entire strategy of some people. Um, Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I would agree to that. But um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, I I hope to see a good substantiated debate between a Bitcoiner and someone who absolutely hates it, you know, with, you know, good coherent thoughts and, and arguments. I, uh, I wonder if we're if we're going to see that. I, know. It's, I mean, it's why I, I love people like um, Lynn Olden because she just seems so calm and measured, and will listen to the one side, listen to the other side, and reach her own conclusion. There was yeah. a quote I read recently, which I'm about to mangle. It was something along the lines of, "For every complicated issue, there is an answer which is." Uh, clear simple and wrong <laughs> so <it's, laughs> that's great yeah, yeah that's great. It's, it's, there, there, there's always nuance there's always there's yeah. always at least two sides and probably more than that to virtually any complicated question yeah i would agree so to wrap up this uh, conversation i want to ask you the last question and i ask everyone the same question and that's what is a core belief that you will never let go <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now that's considering what we've just been talking about with sort of, you know, the transformations of identity. That's a really, really tough one. Um, I'm going to set myself up for failure here. Um, Do it. (laughs) Fundamentally, humans, we as a species can figure it out. We're not necessarily destined to self-destruction we we can do things which will ultimately help us help the planet help you know everything um i'm i'm generally quite optimistic about what humanity can do um (laughs) that, that gets tested um and it's why i have started trying to avoid politics and any kind of like reporting on politics as much as I can, because that's something that can bring that down. But when I hear about technology, um, as I said, you know, the discovery of Bitcoin has made me very optimistic about what, what we can achieve. So, uh, is it a belief I will never let go? Um, who knows, but it's, it's a belief which I would like to hang on to humans can, Humans can get it right. We can do it. I think that's a great positive ending to uh, to this conversation. I uh, I want to re- remind everyone who's listening that, um, of course, by the way, I'm going to uh, link to your Twitter X profile at Change Work Life so people can follow you. But also in the description of this episode, there's a link to have a free complimentary coaching session with you. Uh, yeah, man. So, f- Thanks again for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation and um, yeah, stay in touch. Thanks so much, Ram. It's been a pleasure.
Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening.